our methods Yes, our methods are not the same, of course, but we are in the same cultural context that is emerging from a, a historical period where games were seen as pure anecdotal entertainment. And we know that this is something very crucial. We know that game is absolutely central in the lives of the people. And both this project and all that is developing around video games emerges at, at that, same, that precise time when there is also awareness of the importance of play and games in daily life in, in the society. And I will address this question also looking at, for you, it can be of interest looking at how, how did I come to this project? Why this project? What is the reason behind? <clears throat> so first, a big project like this does not emerge from nothing, of course. It emerges from a long, long uh, study since many years about childhood, about women, about all kinds of so-called anecdotal aspects of daily life, so magic and so on. So social history, social history, religious history. And very naturally, I came to, to play. And in 2013, I had the first project financed by the Swiss National Foundation, which was to organize three exhibitions one taking place in Nyon, it was play in the life course, so from early childhood to adults, even eschatological. So what does it mean to have um, to have uh, game counters or board games in related to death? So really from birth to death. Then the second exhibition took place in 2014 in October. It was play with antiquity, a very interesting topic that is also your topic because it is the reception of antiquity in place today. So board games, but we could add now video games. And finally with uh, Vallon in March, 2015, we address the question of rules. We called it les, les jeux sont faits, the die is cast. Very quickly, it appeared that this exhibition was not the result of, of uh, ongoing researches, but was the start. That's why I focus on it being interactive, interactive, making movies with children, having animation for children as well, and not only children in the exhibition. And uh, it, it worked very, very well. It was uh, also played in Bavay, in Cholet, in France, in many places, in Nuremberg, in Viola Romaine, and with many different settings. And this we could also discuss, how do you display games in a, in a space, in an exhibition space? But what emerged very strongly, it is that really everybody had focused on sport in classical antiquity, and almost nobody about game and play. Why, why this difference? And if I look more closely, what is the state of the art about the history of play and games in general, not just antiquity, it is the same, almost the same. Medieval ages, for instance, in 1990 with Jean-Michel Mill or Elizabeth Belmas, 2006, uh, Michel Monson about toys, 2001. So everything is in the 21st century. Or Ulrich Schedler, it, which is uh, the edit edition with uh, uh, Roberto Calvo the, of um, the book of Alphonse uh, the X, so medieval book, Das Buch der Spiele. So very late, very late entry of historians in the field of Play and games. And I, of course, speak about monographs, not collective volumes that always took place, always were published. If I look at philosophers, it is a bit different. Great interest of philosophers. We can think Winnicott about play and reality, or Jacques Henriot, that probably most of you know. Um, and if I looked at science of education, I would have many slides. So there is a gap. And this gap is even more striking about classical antiquity, the gap for history, for social history, what do we do with play and games? If I look at what was published when I launched this project, mainly exhibition catalogues, nice exhibition catalogues, of course, but it, it means that play games were good to disseminate, to communicate with a wide audience, but it was not the result of a research, of a scientific research, as we are trained to do. The few books that exist, so we, we saw Michel Manson, but Giochi Giocattoli in Antiquita is written by a journalist, you, nice pictures, but don't read the book because he, he, he just repeats what has been said and there are many errors. Stefano De Siena, 
it's also based on an antiquarian approach. I will talk about it. But the exception is about ancient Egypt, with um, and certainly an exception. Anne Vatouri, Walter Christ, uh, <clears throat> Alex de Fogt, ancient Egyptians that play. But 2016, so almost nothing. In fact, the only complete monograph is Louis Beck de Fouquier, 1869. He is the only one who addressed Les Jeux des Anciens in a very uh, full way, very complete way, looking at every topics. And I just show you so that you have an idea of the table of content. You can see how extensive it is based on his reading of ancient authors, mainly, that he read translated. Sometimes he invents games, so it's, it's, it's quite funny. I mean, he says that mosaics could be as well the games of children. In fact, why not? But it is an antiquarian, an encyclopedic tradition. So he follows also the life course, he makes categories, and he goes through until adults, le jeu de la troncule. So it was very clear that if we wanted to go beyond and enter a true social history, we had to make a project. And a project where we cross, we cross uh, sources, so written sources, what kind of text, such as Pollux, you know, I will mention Pollux in a, in a moment, uh, who, who wrote a list of children's games, not only children's games, but a list of games, an anthology was missing and reflections about game and education. Also looking at archaeology, because almost everything was missing, always the same pictures in the books. So let's have a look in at towns, let's have a look at liminal places like tombs, sanctuaries, and of course pictures. With uh, the topic of construction of social identity, children, gender. So taking play, taking games as global history. So looking at education, religion, politics through the lenses, new lenses, the lenses of play and games. And so it's not just about reconstructing past games, rules, it's also reconstructing a social and religious environment and social and religious dynamics. Um, so this was really the aim, it is to access to another view of the past, life experience of actors that hardly emerge in our sources like children uh, and like women, of course. Now with methodological problem because the sources are not many at first sight, but also these sources of, for instance, the text or works of arts, they are made by adults and they are mainly made by men. So how can we approach these actors of the past? One word about our logo. You, you may have noticed, you probably noticed that it is a scene of play, a scene of hide and seek play that I kept since uh, the first exhibition. It was important to keep the same, the same image because so that people could recognize that these are the same people work, working on the topics and developing the topic. This is also something to, to note if you, if you think of doing some, a, a project of that kind. And also because I didn't find something similar at the entrance of an exhibition on archaeology, it was, of course, a bit of fun to, 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 to put that, because hide and seek, what material do you have? You have nothing. And it tells us that play is an immaterial heritage. And this is something very important. We are missing a lot of information, and we must be modest. Now you see also playing Erotes. This is the, the main sort of uh, the actual uh, wall painting from Herculano, Casa dei Cervi, where many children are depicted playing, playing. and not any children because they are, these are Erotes. And it tells us also that it has, that play has to do with youth, not just children, but youth with coming of age. It's something very important in the life of like, young people and why? And also it has to do with culture, with paideia. And all this is contained in the terms, in Greek terms, pais, the child, paideia, the game, paideia, education, all is contained there. And we even have a, a word of Eros in the Remedies for Love, who says to Eros, a child you are, and like a child you should play. 
We have a double sense because play in Latin means also seduce, and you know that eros has little arrows and make people fall in love and so on. So play can have different meanings and not just innocent play. If I recapitulate, uh, the aim, the ambition was to collect for the first time as comprehensively as is possible the evidence, written, archaeological, iconographic, and study it in a pluridisciplinary way. And only crossing all these views, we can access to something about past Ladic cultures and understand not just the rules, but the social and the religious dynamics. And that's where we cross each other. It is because I think we contribute to contemporary issues because today, of course, all these ancient games disappear. Now we have video games. Huh? Are these engendering new form or sociability or not? What has changed, in fact? Huh? And this we could discuss as well. So the point was also about historicizing games. Very often you read Jeux de Toujours as if the games had been the same since prehistory and nothing had changed. No, of, on the contrary, we look at when does it appear? What meaning does it have in one specific context? And I just take the example of a hoop. The hoop in Greece, it is the image of Ganymedes, the, the beautiful boy who is seduced by Zeus. And so it's really a logo of beauty, of male beauty, youth beauty. In Rome, this is, an, this is an intaglio, this is a ring. You have this boy running with a hoop, but this boy running with a hoop for a Roman, this is a Greek game. So this is a boy playing like a Greek in the gymnasium and playing with a hoop because a Roman would never do that. So it has another cultural meaning in a Roman context. And not in, not in Greece, not in Rome, you would have a girl playing the hoop. It does not exist. So the girl with a hoop, 1885, Renoir, does not exist in antiquity, not thinking about the hula hoop song. So there are games that appear and games that disappear, or they change, the sex changes. I will not extend on that, but the Ephedrismos game, the, the carriers game, is a very, not a strange game, but a, a funny game where, where one, one person is the rider of, of, of the other, who, who plays the horse or plays, yes, the horse, and she's throwing a ball. And this, this game did not go through at all as it is. This disappeared, but the hoop went on. Now, among other, other questions, cultural questions, is about all these contiguities that sometimes were felt as oppositions and are not. For instance, games and rights. Is, is a game a kind of ritual? This is an age old questions among, among anthropologists, but we can we can talk about it or game and divination. Why why are so many oracles stay taken with gaming material like the knuckle bones, the famous knuckle bone? Martial says it when none of the bones you throw stands with the same face, face as another, you will say that I have given you a big present because a knuckle bone has four sides. So if you throw four knuckle bone and each on another side, it is the lucky throw, the throw of Venus. And you see it here, it is the print of an intaglio, it is a rose. So um, I don't know how you say it in English, but in French we say, uh, uh, heureux au jeu, malheureux en amour. Uh, but for the Romans, the contrary, you are, you are, when you are lucky, you are lucky everywhere. And of course, we have no time here to, to talk about toys, but there are all these faux semblants. Huh? It looks like a doll. Is it a doll like a Barbie or is it not? Of course it's not. And this is part also of the work we have undertaken. Reconstructing rules, reconstructing rules is of course very difficult because there is no, no guide for, for these such rules. We can look at the structure of, so for instance, this pentagrammi, this five lines game. And what we have as text to, to show you how difficult it is, there is first, for instance, this fragment in Pollux, famous Pollux, so second century AD, of the five lines on each side, the one in the middle was called the sacred line. It's not easy to reconstruct a game with such sentences, but that's what we have. And in fact, Pollux, 
to give you a more wider introduction, Julius Pollux of writes a dictionary with a list of words and a short description of playing games. But his aim is not to teach people how to play. His aim is to teach Greek, good Greek, to, to the emperor Commodus, who is, who is still a young man. So not to provide rules. So we have these, these descriptions and he makes list of names according to the suffix and so on to the grammar and so it's not easy at all and the example i take is based on the our logo for instance pollux describes three types of hide and seek games three types i will not describe them all but what happens here is he going to sit, uh, the child who is uh, closing uh, his eyes, is he going to sit? Uh, or as here, uh, as described, one of the players sits in the middle of a group, eyes closed, while the others run away. And there is a version where the others hit him uh, with, uh, with something, with strips of papyrus. And we made this animation to show that, huh, have text. But do we have rules? It can be many rules. And if you go on our website, you will see the three possibilities. So lost games, lost rules, we can reconstruct them. We, we have tried to. Uh, there are proposals and made in collaboration with the Swiss Museum of Games, with Ulrich Schädler, who is an expert in, in that field. But we also looked at other things, social rules, for sure we can now uh, analyze them and understand the cultural fabric of past societies. One word, because we, you, we, you all travel and remember when you see funny marks on, on, on the pavement to take pictures, to send them to us, because we go on collecting all these marks to understand a game typology and renewing the one that was published 2007. Uh, versus in Ephesus, so you, you find all kinds of marks on the pavement. People did play on the floor, which is also interesting outside at the view of all uh, and um, we, we, we collect these. Also we collect lost objects in the storeroom of museums. This is what we announced in the project and indeed that's what happened. And now for instance we have this very last uh, find published in Palace 2022. It is just out in the Roman villa of Magerois, so it's Roman Gaul, there was a rig die filled with mercury. As it appears, not even one centimeter uh, big, huh? um, so empty, but filled with mercury. And Thomas Daniel has made a very beautiful paper about how you, you could trick, you could cheat with dice using such extraordinary objects. It is the first ever found, but we found a magician using the same technique today. And in his hands, you see he has uh, this die with, filled with mercury, but these ones are from Roman period. So you see that at, at, as well as play and games are very ancient, cheating is as ancient as games. <laughs> and this is, for instance, another example of also an object that was sleeping in the storeroom of Alba Fuchens. It's a, it's a doll made of wood. It is the first ever found. So what did we do to, to make all these discoveries? Well, we had to build an international and pluridisciplinary research community. Because in fact, when I started, apart from Ulrich Schedler, Walter Christ, uh, you saw the names, uh, Alex de Fogt. Well, that, that's it. Uh, you, you, you have not even one hand of researchers specialized in the field. So if we want to explode, to explore also other, um, other topics, we have to ask colleagues to join. And, and how do you make them join? By organizing conferences. Um, and uh, we had many, we started very, very early and we very good friends in Caen joined the Board Game Studies Association, the International Toy Research Association. And when the pandemic arrived, it was not that bad because we started a webinar. And the webinar allowed us to really to communicate with the world. You can see in 2020, we had people in Haifa, in Kent, in Munich, in Krakow, Zurich, New York, Warwick, Milano. It was just extraordinary. And uh, so having a meeting as we are having now and a true exchange of ideas and main um, quite a long, se a large series of this is in the issue of Palace that is just out um, reflecting what we shared during the pandemics. 
We also built very quickly a website to share open access resources. So the publication, a lexicon we made, the typology we made, uh, as well as the database of images and a database of ancient board games. That's why I say, please send us pictures if you find them, if possible, with GPS coordinates. And we have a collaborative bibliography on ancient playing games. If you wish to join, feel free to join. Um, you can access it through the website, but it doesn't work as good as when you are yourself in uh, the system. You have access to everything and you can add also bibliography. We went on having exhibitions because we went on disseminating the results, as here in Lyon, Luc de Noum, the exhibition looked like a, a doll's house with, with places and colors corresponding to different topics. And at the, the end, a very large place where people could play as well. We had also the video, a large video game uh, on display, which was, which was fun, also to show the reception of antiquity in games today. But today can also be today elsewhere. And elsewhere, for instance, here is Morocco, Amazigh children, so Berber children. And we could benefit from exchanges with Jean-Pierre Rossi, who is an anthropologist doing, has, who has done doing all his lifelong field work in Morocco. And for us, it helped to understand the ecology of play, such as these children you know, on Greek vases with a rolling stick. Well, they are doing just the same in, in Morocco. And we, but here we know the age. We, we have a, a glimpse of the agency of the children, knowing how to cook, uh, make animals, and things that are much more difficult to find. And in that research community, people you may feel like meeting as well, Digital Ludem Project in Maastricht, they are modeling strategy games in a playable database and reconstructing sort of DNA of games. So a project for, for informatics, not for history, but very important. And in Warsaw, we, we worked with uh, Katarzyna Marciniak, our mythical childhood, about reception, as well as about uh, the ERC map in Toulouse, about religion. And Milano, of course, has been one of our big collaboration and exchange is because they also started about the years 2012 to work on games independently and now we, we work fully together. The definition of game, as you know, is difficult. Uh, yes, I show you Homo Ludens, Johan Huizinga, Roger Caillois. Traditionally, play is defined as something voluntary within certain fixed limits of time and place, rules freely accepted and the feeling of tension of joy. And uh, uh, Kaiwa adds other elements such as competition, agon, uncertainty, alia, mimicry, role games, and e links uh, having to do with uh, dwindle, having to do with also uncertainties. For us, the main person with whom we collaborated, because with Zinga and Kaiwa anyway uh, have passed away, is Robert Amayon, who is a wonderful anthropologist and wrote this book that you can access online. Uh, in Chicago, why we play an anthropological study. And uh, we gave her the Dr. Honoris Causa at Fribourg University in 2020. What she brought to us is the key element to understand games in antiquity, which is this notion of luck, this notion of un undetermined, but undetermined that you can control, that you can train to control. She explains that in her fieldwork, which is Mongolia, the Buryat, uh, the Mongolia, as she says, the randomness of a game's outcome creates playing dynamics. The notion of luck is at the center of this dimension. Because play, when you play, you have a positive attitude. You are acting, uh, acting upon what must happen. First, when you play, you want to win, for instance. Huh? And so you, you have a positive mindset. But it goes much further. Playing by its structure allows people to overcome the undetermined. This explains why so many divinatory or propitiatory practices are structured as games and why, conversely, the act of playing is willingly seen as being somewhat augural. And one of the points that we have discussed a lot is the notion of hazard, chance. Are these games with dice just chance games? In German, and sometimes I pick, a, I pick a word in another language, they say Glückspiel, 
you 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 play to to be lucky and this explains to me why on some board games you have inscriptions this is for instance a kind of alia a backgammon game inscription that say uh, the roman are good the, the enemy are, are defeated the romans play it's not just imperialism it is also the ideology of the game you play to to win you play to win and so when you play you you express the fact that you want to win. But as we know, we can also cheat. And Martial, for instance, for the Turricula says, says that such towers, play towers, were was invented because some try to cheat. So we can we can discuss that. But on the tower where you throw the dice so that you cannot cheat. And what's interesting now that I, I speak to you because the magician explains that he touches the die so that the mercury goes into the right place when he throws the dice. And I always wondered why do they invent a turricula? Um, why do they invent a turricula? Because, well, if you throw the dice from a goblet, it's the same. But no, in fact, if touching, maybe he's thinking of a mercury die. The fraudulent hand, skilled in disposing dice to foreigners, he may mean the mercury die. It throws them from me, succeed only in wishing, because here you no more touch them, and so you cannot influence the content. So uh, what is our new theory? Because we have a new theory. <laughs> we try to, we try to. Of course, it must be supple, it must be flexible. Antiquity is not the same as today. And it depends of place, of time. It's not the same in Greece. It's not the same in Rome. We can attempt to have a, a global definition of play, but then the cultural one is very important. Just, just an, an example. So we had this book. Oh, everything is online. Huh? So you can read it online on our website. So playing games in classical antiquity, definition, transmission, reception. In order to understand how we got to know about ancient games. Who are these authors? How, what is their discourse to, to understand what they say better? Well, we understood that in fact, there is a big distinction between the Greek and the Roman. In Greek, everything is around pais, the child. Pais, paidia, paidion, paidzain. And with paidzain, it means to play. And as with eros, it means also to seduce. Uh, you, you seduce somebody. Uh, in French, we still say it, uh, jouer, jouer de quelqu'un, and so on. Paideia, education. And never a Greek would confuse play and sport, which is atla. Play first is an activity without prizes. You can play where you want, with whom you want, in any place. Uh, while sport, well, these are individuals who are highly trained, they compete for prizes, for institutional prizes, they have also official training, and the aim of sport is war, of course. There is this paramilitary connotation which makes sport much more valuable than play. And in English, you have a distinction still present. You never say Olympic play. You always say Olympic games. And this distinction is in Greek. While in Latin, and the confusion, Olympische Spiele, for instance, they say the German or Jeux Olympiques, uh, the Greek would never have understood this, this term, comes from the Latin, from the Roman, where ludus means the school, but it also means the ludi privati and the ludi publici, so the gladiators, the circus. Ha, it's something else. So the contiguities with sport are very strong. And where do you draw the line? It's much more difficult. But we find the same. Ludere means to play and to seduce. So our definition is that play is a modality of action. It is an experience. It has to do with an activity. It is, has to do also with an emotion. With performance, play is a performance associated with collective pleasure. The notion of pleasure is absolutely crucial with ritual activities, but also erotic enticement and also managing risk and luck. And we are in societies with high risk. We are still in societies with high risk. And when you play, you train also, you exercise also risk. You take a risk, you win or you lose, you play again. So you are not defeated forever. You know that you can try to reverse roles. And this is a very important training for life. And both for Greek and for the Latin, what is important, it has to do so with an age category, first, childhood, youth, 
education. But as said Mark Golden, who has a beautiful paper in our volume uh, about play, sport, dance, ball games, categories in motion, he warns us categories are always very messy. They are imprecise. They involve overlap. So we are very, very careful with this, but nevertheless, there are distinctions according to time and place that we can keep. On our website, you will find uh, all that we have produced and go on to produce, as well as our new collections. So all these you can click and, and access online. I quickly review them because it was very important to see, also for us, to see the progress we, we, we do little by little. Kentron, which was published in Caen, uh, allowed us to say where we stand when we, at the time we started the project, also with Archaeologia. And then with the catalogue of Lyon, we had made already many progress, and Salvatore Costanza published the games in translation. It had never been published in modern translation of the Excerpta de Ludis, the part about the games, with all the comparanda, so a very, very precious tool to, to, to go further. Then special issues, and it goes on. Then in 2020, we have Palace with a collection of papers about education, Heraclitus, Le Temps est un enfant qui joue. On the cover, intentionally, we have a girl, I mean, who is uh, pushing um, columns as if they were counters. Uh, also to say that this enfant can, could be a girl, we could push further the, the question, but it's a question that remains open. And last year, so we had about uh, an issue about uh, errors, about transgressions, and two volumes about so definition and back to the game. So starting to map all this uh, information from archaeology, so dice, counters, board games, and this is the first volume. Now we have a new collection, so Je Play Spiel. If you have a book that you would like to propose, think of us. It is in Liège. The approach is more about text and philology, but it's open to also, uh, and, and not only ancient antiquity, huh? it, it, it is really from antiquity until today. And I think that Yannick has one volume to say that it goes up to video games. It's not restricted to one period. And for now, we have some of this new issue of Palace, Quaderneur sur la culture antique, that provides the, the very new information about war and, and play. And these are the, the very next ones that are in press now about women as players. It's also a diachronic approach from ancient Mesopotamia to video games. And this notion of hazard, which, which will appear, uh, which will be discussed in the issue of Kernos, which also will appear within a few weeks. And I have a little book about transgression. It's about a, a child who misbehaves. And um, it is an exploration of transgression or not uh, about play, because you can, because transgression and violence is also part of the game, and toys uh, soon out. I would like to stress on the new collection that is out, which is called Locus Ludi in Darmstadt, uh, Wissenschaftliche Burgesellschaft in collaboration with mine, with von Sabern, where we will have uh, a number of, of books. Alessandro Pace so has completed his survey of Pompeii. He will have it out in Firenze, as but and Marco will have his book on anthology in Liège, but we will have now a series of books having to do with um, archaeology, iconography on the game of a Cotabos, that's what you played when you were drinking in the symposium, in the banquet, and it will be very useful, and Barbara Kari about this, this famous knuckle bones. I'll show you a glimpse of what Alessandro has found in Pompeii. This is a view of Pompeii, which is an impossible place. Old excavation, modern excavation, more or less good, and whole part of the city not yet excavated. Nevertheless, there are elements that can be, that can be addressed, such as how do we identify a game, die shakers, pebbles, or counters, how do you do that? And he does it in very, very well. Also trying to find methodologically means to, to attain this, this reality by the, the notion of ludic assemblage. 
and uh, and we giggled because uh, in fact he also pro proposes the, the archaeology of cardboards wardrobes that's where you find assemblages and pompeii in pompeii you can you can excavate wardrobes <laughs> where people kept uh, storerooms where people kept the material and he dis he discovered uh, some common places to dispel first we see the people playing in the carpona in the tavern but most of of the, of the elements come from home so the players would bring home the material or they would play home and not just in taverns where almost nothing is from taverns. Talking about reconstructing the rules, what are the achievements? Well, we reconstructed five games and two versions of five games. The very last ones are the knuckle bones. And we did it in collaboration with the Angevante, so um, in, in the University of Vienna uh, for uh, applied arts with uh, Ernst von Struhl and his team. Uh, and so, yes, and, and of course, informaticians. And just to show you how we did. So we asked them, do please reconstruct the pentagrammae, so these ancient Greek board games. And first they proposed a marble and uh, very quickly we said we don't want marble, but, but nevertheless, it was just the background. So we had to define how we play. Uh, you have seen the structure, it's not, not obvious to understand how it works. And that's where Ulrich Schädler, who, who knows very well the ergonomy of games, could, could, could find solution. So we decided it goes in this way. So each player starts here and then we, we go around and the famous sacred place that Pollux mentioned is that this is the goal for the player. The blue ones must end here and the yellow one must end at the other end. So place the five counters on the other hand. So the first thing was to reconstruct the ergonomy of the game. Now the question was, the question was also how it would run. Uh, and so where, where the, the die would be thrown. So they, as they say, the die will always, will be always thrown by itself. The die also appears on the side of the players once it's their turn. So we had to discuss this. How do I know that it's my turn to play? So the dice appears on your side when it is your turn to play. The model we asked to choose, we said, no, no, this marble does not go, this, this material, this stone is not good. Let's choose as a model, the one we have archeologically. So these miniature tables in terracotta, from attic tombs, and we chose one like this. Huh? We, we know five like this. This one is the Swiss, in the Swiss Museum of Games. They proposed something like that before proposing the terracotta table. And we said, no, 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 we don't want that because there is this head of a young boy. And we said, no, these are not children who play these. These are soldiers, these are Achilles, Ajax. So we don't want that. So they proposed um, a stone. But it was funny because they proposed a stone completely broken as if for, for them antiquity was uh, pl was prehistory and said no no in antiquity where they have nice tables, it was not broken that's the archaeologist who finds them broken, so we want it to be as it was. And also they made a, a hole here to place the counters that does not exist, so this was dispelled and these little circles do not correspond to our reality. So little by little, so these elements here disappear and little by little, we arrive more or less to what we have. Here too, we ask to suppress this, this funny line and also again, these little circles. And little by little, we arrive to what we wanted, which is more or less the model that you see exhibited in the Swiss Museum of Games of so the pebbles. And when it is your turn, the, um, the dice appear and, and, and you can throw it. Remain the question of the structure and Veronika Koch had her master thesis in 2020 in Vienna about it and she tested with 200 children what is best, the best pentagram, how do we go round and she, she tried to see if, if for children if it was round it would be better, more easy to understand or not. And also, if a story had to be built, here, here is uh, an animal, here is uh, a little child, if, if children preferred a story to be told in order to play, and I will not expand on that, we can discuss that. And we finally had to choose, for instance, these, these elements, how 
how to raise questions, how to touch the, 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 the die, do we want it to be visible how you, when, when you touch or not. So now we have pentagrammi, and I hope you will try in five, in four languages and in two versions. One version where you just run and the other version where you knock out uh, the opponent. And I must say that children prefer the, 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 that version, not just running around. So we had also many animations. I will not show them all now because it would be long, such as the animating, uh, animating the, the error test, but this was very important. Maybe for me, the, the, the big outcome was to discover that these images of play had never, never been studied by, for themselves. And in fact, these images convey uh, many messages that are very important to understand ancient cultures. And that's what I call the metaphorical power of play. Stephen Kidd in 2019 says it very well, play is a manifestation of pleasure itself. And for this reason, there can be no moment during play without pleasure, since play is its defining feature. And that's why we like the topic, isn't it? It's because it has to do with pleasure and we enjoy working on it and we enjoy uh, very much. And in antiquity, uh, this metaphor goes for love very, very, very often. We spoke about ball games. I show you an example that had never been studied because, well, if this is a funerary urn, so it is a box, if you want, to have the ashes of a, of, of a deceased, and the deceased was a woman, if you had only that, you would read, this woman was a slave, Margaris Serwa, a slave. The slave of Marcus uh, Marcus Alius Herma. Okay, that's all we know. But if we look at the picture, the picture tells us another story. You have this woman seated facing the man. They are not playing any game. They are playing a game that we call the latrunculi, which is played without dice. I show you the picture. And we know that it is a sort of strategic game. And latrunculi can come from latrones, the, the mercenaries, so the soldiers. So they are playing a game of soldiers. And there, is, there are little details that are very funny. Look where they play. They have put a basket. That's the wool basket that normally is on all steel uh, of deceased women to say that they were good housewives. And for this one, huh, the basket is upside down. They have put the, the board and they are playing together. And we guess that she's winning. She's turning her face towards us. She's on the left. So these are elements encoded, meaning that she's the strong one and he's playing too with, with her. Uh, and so there is kind of intimacy between the two and both of them are touching, are touching the basket as if making the contact between the two, but the contact between a living and the dead, because the woman has passed away. And this may mean also something that forever they will be joined by this, in, in that forever pleasure of playing together, as if this, this moment of pleasure will never disappear and it is part of her memory. And as well as it is the, 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 the discourse on Ars Amatoria as being a tactical, a strategic way of enjoying an affair. And if you want to prepare a video game about Romans, you must know that Cleopatra, for instance, when you want to speak about a woman being very inciting, uh, uh, these women, and Ovidia says the same, that they learn playing, playing with men. And in Rome, you have women playing with men, and it is part of their common pleasure. For instance, Cleopatra, she, she lived with Antony, and she played a dice with him, drank with him, hunted with him, and by night they would go out, and she would go with him on his round of mad follies, wearing the garb of a serving maiden. I showed you just one picture of, of Greek, the Greek version of that uh, ideology. Here is an Apulian skiffos. It is from South Italy. Apulia is in South Italy near Taranto. Huh? And uh, these were Greek colonies and they copy the, the Greek way of painting vases and with images of play. And here what we see is a girl walking and that's the Ephedrismos game that I showed you at the start. But Eros this time is blinding her eyes. So she's walking and it shows the undeterminacy of the walk of a woman 
uh, who is under the control of Eros. Eros blinds you. Huh? We still say it in French, uh, le, le, l'amour rend aveugle. It is the image. Huh? Uh, so she's blinded by Eros and she walking, she's walking towards the aim. But the aim could also be interpreted as being above uh, the belt. And the belt, you know, is, is the code of marriage. So she's walking towards marriage, dressed like a married girl. And the other code, it is that she's playing the horse. Huh? Remember, the Ephedrismos is the game of a horse. One of the player is the horse and ridden by the other player. And Euripides says that the young girls are like young horses, young female horses, ignoring the yoke of marriage. So that's really the image of a girl being tamed by Eros and going towards the marriage. But as you know, play is voluntary, so she wants to. And so that's the image that you have on the, on the reverse, the same girl, but this time looking at a young boy and uh, apparently very happy of it. Uh, this image too, I like very much. I must show you first this one. Uh, the same play on words is with a seesaw. You see two here, two girls playing on a seesaw and uh, they are balancing. It's a play which is a bit d- difficult because uh, it's a bit risky. Huh? They can fall. They are playing standing on 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 the on on uh, on here on the seesaw. Uh, here you can see how they jump even. And the tree is another code saying girls are ripe for marriage as apple are ripe for marriage. And in fact, in iconography, you only find girls doing that. Never men, only girls. And so on this vase, again, Apollyon vase painting, for the first time, we have a man and a woman. Very striking. You must know the whole series. It's comic theater, of course. These are actors. You see they are dressed like actors. And here the woman, the woman is not that attractive. She, she's very plump. She's very heavy. She's so heavy that he's jumping very high. And we can guess that these are, because these are always mythological scenes, Zeus, and we know that Zeus seduced Alcman by taking the shape of his her husband, Amphitryon, during the night. And that's how they conceived Heracles. So to show how he seduced her, the vast painter took the image of the game, of the seesaw game. There is no more tree with ripe apples. It's a strange tree because, in fact, they are both adults. But it's a way to show that Alcman agreed to be seduced by him, by him, because again, you don't play if you don't agree to play with, with the other one. And the other element, which I find very nice too, it is that none of them is young, but it is a way to show that loves keep you young, but I would say that play keeps you young. To finish my term, my, my little round, I would like to say a word about lucky players, chance, uh, luck. Luck, not chance, luck. It's very striking, and this is ongoing work, why so, how, why so many devices of game are part of amuletic devices. So as here, we have an amber die, we have a miniature uh, amber die in, uh, in, in amber ring, and uh, knuckle bones as being part of, of, of a ring. And there are many uh, discussions about it, and that's where we meet Roberta Mayon in Mongolia, just to show you that we, we work in this way, in a comparative way, not to say that the Greeks are like the Mongolians, but it's good to think about it. When in antiquity you threw your bones, it was the same as in Mongolia, not to know if you are lucky, but you throw them until you get the right throw. So think about it, it's also good. This is this proactive, this positive attitude. It's about a man, a man who is in love. He enters the sanctuary of Aphrodite. And when he wished to give himself some little comfort from his suffering, because he suffers, loves make you suffer. After first addressing the goddess, so Venus, Aphrodite, he would count out on the table four knuckle bones of a Libyan gazelle and take a gamble on his expectations, which means he wants to know if he will be lucky or not. And the throw of Venus is one that's, that's, that's Take a gamble on his expectation. If you get this, then you you will win. You will win the, the lover. 
If, as usually happens, he made an indifferent throw onto his table and the knuckle bones reveal an unpropitious result, he would curse all kneaders and show utter dejection as if at an irremediable disaster. But a minute later, he would snatch up the knuckle bones and try to cure by another throw his earlier lack of success. So you see the attitude. It is that, that you, you throw until you get what you want. That's the same we do in research, isn't it? We try, we don't get it, we try again, we get it, and then people say, oh, you have always been lucky. And uh, the same can be said about dice. And here I would like to show you a nice object. It's a little, uh, a little pot made of amber of a very good friend of mine who said that they are from my grand aunts because it contains two dice, so more than 100 years old. When I was a pupil, I had them with me whenever we wrote a test. And after the test, I threw the dice to get a hint what mark the test would bring. This is my private, little, little private story. So to you, you see again uh, how dice can, can be used in, in your life. I would to finish, I would like to finish with Augustus. Augustus, to come back to this notion of luck, of luck and positive mindset that provides games. We know that Augustus liked to play, and he liked to play also at knuckle bones, dice, and nuts with little boys. And some have said, well, it's just because of pederasty, because he liked little boys. I don't think so searching everywhere for such as were attractive for their pretty faces of their prater, especially Syrians and Moors. Because of the end of a sentence, he abhorred dwarfs, cripples, and everything of that sort as freaks of nature and of ill omen. And I think that children, like our little erotes with pretty faces, are of good omen. And to play with children gives you energy, gives you a positive view of life. And for me, that's why in Herculanum, in the Casa dei Cervi, the walls were filled with children at play. This, this is not an innocent thing. To conclude, you will tell me now, oh, that's, that's uh, soon, huh? 2023 is the game over because I have one year extension to finish publishing all that is due and was delayed because of pandemic, which is good, which is excellent. Of course, it's not over for different reasons. First, and here's my wish list, I wish so much to be able to create a video game based on ancient games. This is not impossible. We will try to get funding for that. Um, you have a picture here, but we already made the first steps in, in the game. So, for instance, this is the game of Augustus because he played with his friends. We can reconstruct that. And the idea would be to have a gladiator in, in a taverna and you play against him. Or you enter or you enter the temple and you, and you throw the knuckle bones to know what the oracle tells you. These are true oracles. These are true oracles that were written uh, in, in uh, Greek sanctuaries. Another thing would be to reconstruct modelizing an interactive Greek abacus, which can also serve as pentagrammae. This, uh, I can send you the, the address of a paper that I wrote with uh, Jérôme Gavin. It's about this stila where we see a child and a man sitting, and they are, in fact, playing together. Ah, not playing a game, but in fact, he's teaching uh, on an abacus how to count. I'll show you the detail. And you see the five lines, you see, you see the semicircle. And we made a very extensive um, exploration of this motif. It's not just this, it is more complex. It has to do with the way they counted in the med medieval ages. And you have little crosses as here or here. And on, on many of these five line games, you, you find these little crosses that are used for counting. And this is how we, we reconstructed the way of counting. So this would be nice. And you must know also that I got another project by the Swiss National Science Foundation on Greek and Roman jointed dolls. Because after all I have told you, you have understood that it is impossible to work on dolls. Moreover, and dolls are another mystery because they are not that, what they look like. They look like objects of similar size to the Barbie, but they are something else. What? And I have another team now working on these for until 2000, 
24, and we plan to have an exhibition on Greek and Roman articulated dolls in 2024 in the Museum Articulator, in the Museum of Yverdon. And I hope that Locus Ludi will go to Reading, your museum, in 2023 in Great Britain. Fingers crossed that all goes well. So in fact, no, game is not over. Uh, and you just follow us because we're on Twitter. Facebook is a bit slow because we have too much to do. <laughs> but on Twitter, we we go on. We go on doing that and we would be happy for, for your remarks uh, and uh, sending pictures and exchanging about past and modern and present games. Thank you for your attention.